Welcome to the Gaudium et Spes podcast, where every other week we bring you Catholic teachings and stories of faith from people throughout the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. Now, here are your hosts, Suzanne McNinch and Ches Filippini. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Gaudium Ed Spez podcast. As always, if you haven't, please check out our last episode where Bishop Bill started his first in a three-part series on the apostles. And it's always great to learn more about um, our Catholic faith and especially the apostles who, um, you know, that's the descendant of where Bishop is right now. So it's pretty incredible. But we're back in the studio today and we have two incredible guests with us. We have um, Dave and Aaron Kimball. Um, if many of you don't know, um, Dave is our chief financial officer or our CFO and his beautiful wife, Erin, with us. Um, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. And above all, for Suzanne and I, mutual friends yes. who we've known for quite a while, which is really yeah. cool. So. Since I moved here nine years ago, it was the first time we met. So yeah. yeah. It was really awesome. I know. Dave and Aaron, this is uh, the Gaudi Mitzvah podcast. We always start out with the first line from that document, which you're familiar with from Vatican II, which goes, the joys, the hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and the hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. So y'all are doing the following the Christ thing and uh, following Christ thing. And <laughs> try in the midst best, of right? work and raising six children, there's a lot of joys, hopes, griefs and anxieties. So what do you got? What's going on lately? Well, we did go to the fair on Friday. We did. And that was a lot of fun. I actually had way more fun than I thought I would because the kids, just their faces light up seeing these rides. And then it got darker and the lights came on. And even our oldest was like, oh, wow, look at this place. And they just went on rides multiple times. And then even our littlest, well, Annie, second, second to littlest, we went down the fun slide, and she was very, very scared the first time. But then right when we got off, she ran right back around to the entrance to get back in line. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, we're going to do it again. And then we did it like, you know, four or five times. It was great. Um, but just the joy of going on carnival rides together on Friday was really fun. There's nice. something that's like timeless Americana <laughs> yep. about going to the fair as the weather the, the the temperature starts falling mm-hmm. and it feels like fall and mm-hmm. it's just yeah you just feel rooted in like this is America and this is amazing <laughs> yeah just fantastic yeah. any um any play any games or eat any of the food or I don't oh, oh Timmy did a game the the pool um oh Timothy <laughs> yeah. our confident nine year old <laughs> really. It, it, he saw this $200 if you can hold on to the pull-up bar for 90 yeah. seconds. And he was like, Dad, I can do that, and I will win that $200. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to give you one shot at it because it's 10 bucks, all right? right? And I'm not going to blow $80 tonight every time you think that you can do this. Well, he pumped himself up, and he was like, I, I can definitely do this. And he, he gets up and he lasted about 25 seconds, which was respectable bad, mm-hmm. for a nine year old. And I mean, really respectable for anybody. I'm, I could probably do about 10 seconds. <laughs> Doesn't um, the bar move? When the your, bar moves, yeah. it's on bearings. Oh. So, it's so you really don't really know hold. that, I don't yeah. think, mm-hmm. until you get up there. Right. You're like, oh. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he got home and he was like, next year. I will do 90 seconds <laughs> and I am going to start practicing now. And so he went out in the garage on the pull-up bar and, and hung for about oh 45 and he was like, next year, I'm getting the $200. So. I love it. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's super fun. Timmy, if you've ever seen him on any kind of a, an athletic field, you understand this determination immediately. It's just like laser focused yes. and I will score all the goals and score all the, make all the touches. Mm-hmm. That's fun. Nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, Suzanne, what do you got going on? Yeah, you know, um, continuous football games oh, no. and things like that. So we won't get into whose record is better this yeah, year. Yeah, I, right? I was waiting for that. Yeah, that's okay. It's the first time I've mentioned it. So, Good. and that's I'll great. do it very politely. But no, mm-hmm. I think um, a real highlight for me is um, my godson, um, Henry, asked me to be his um, sponsor for confirmation. Oh, cool. So, yeah, we had a, a class that we did recently together, and um, it is. It's very special, and I love that I get to continue his faith journey with him. Mm-hmm. So, 
It's really neat. And this, y'all, this is the original vision of a godparent. Is they're mm-hmm. supposed to accompany you, mm-hmm. like if you're if you have a default confirmation spot, you're supposed to be your godparent. So yeah. way to stick with them. Yeah, thank you. Nice work. Yeah. Oh man, as you guys mentioned the fair, I realized that the fair is my anxiety of the week because <laughs> uh, my eighth grader Lucia, who just turned fourteen. Happy birthday, Lucia. Um, she has she has a, if you're watching this, somebody, a strong air quotes boyfriend, okay? Oh. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Lovely family um, at, at Sacred Heart. And they just informed us that they would like to invite Lucia to the Pensacola Fair okay. on Wednesday, this, yesterday by the time you're hearing this, mm-hmm. for kind of a supervised date. Oh. And it is... Uh, I don't know, man. Every milestone in Lucia's life, it's just kind of like it feels too soon. And this one was just like, <laughs> what is happening? Um, so it's a lovely family. We're going to go chaperone them. I'm sure they're barely going to even acknowledge each other's presence. They're going to probably, <laughs> you know, just run off in different directions and, and go on rides. And That's what you think, Dad. That, <laughs> oh, don't say it, Suzanne. Don't say it. So, um, so yeah, filled with joy and anxiety on that one. But, uh, yeah, the fair is a magical place. It's a place of adolescent mm-hmm. growth and... You know, almost falling off of rides that are designed to right. last 50 years with no repairs and no go. maintenance. <laughs> oh, man. And can well, be cool. disassembled in 20 minutes. Right? That's right. <laughs> and put on the back of a tractor trailer and shipped across the country. Good grief. It's always wow. fun. Americana to the max. You were right, Dave, on that one. Um, well, oh, good. Suzanne. Well, you know, we're here for a, a better reason mm-hmm. than just um, talking about the fair, although the <laughs> fair is very exciting. We're here to get to know a little bit more about Aaron and Dave. And so we always kind of like to start out finding out a little bit about yourself. So um, Aaron and Dave, can you kind of tell us um, where you grew up, um, you know, a little bit about your Catholic faith journey, mm-hmm. and then we'll get into some other interesting things. So Sure. Um, yeah, I grew up in Central Florida. And I went to St. Mary Magdalene Catholic School from like pre-K through eighth grade. And then I continued uh, at high school, Bishop Moore Catholic High School. And then I went to Notre Dame. I love (laughs) Catholic school. I love Catholic school. I think it's such a beautiful community. It felt safe and it felt like I was being encouraged constantly by the people around me, teachers and students. Um... And I just had such a great experience in Catholic school that it like that really informed that definitely informed the rest of my life mm-hmm. um, where I am now even so yeah yeah just pretty cool very good Dave <laughs> yeah so I only went to Catholic school for a little bit of elementary school when we were living in Southern California mm-hmm. so uh, originally from the Los Angeles area. But uh, we moved to New Hampshire when I was in adolescence, um, a variety of reasons, but uh, which I won't get into now. But um, <laughs> and that was wonderful growing up in New England. Um, it ended up going to St. Anselm College for college, which is in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, run by the Benedictine monks, and that was really a transformative <laughs> experience for me. Mm-hmm. Um, just recommitting to my faith and kind of taking it on as as an adult at that point. Um, I, I majored in philosophy and, and absolutely loved diving into the great books and, and the history of Western civilization. Um, had some great friends and, and tried to kind of get involved in all of the extracurriculars, theater and choir and some sports and uh, admissions and all, all sorts of things in, in college life. And um, somebody just sort of on a whim – said, uh, what, you should think about going to Notre Dame and, and doing their ACE program after graduation. And I said, okay, sure, that, that sounds great. And uh, in in hindsight, really, the, the spirit leads you where you, you don't even expect. And um, the very first day on campus at Notre Dame uh, for ACE program, I was kind of wide-eyed, like, wow, this is a pretty amazing place. And um, on the way to the opening retreat, I'm sitting right near Aaron and we strike up a conversation and and within a couple of weeks it was like I pretty sure this is long term and <laughs> we're probably going to be married someday and, and wow. this is uh, yeah we, we we knew pretty quick but um, really speaking about magical right bringing back the the word from from the fair mm-hmm. uh, it, just being on on campus at Notre Dame and going for walks and and having meals in the dining hall together mm-hmm. and spending time in our classes together through the ACE program and. Uh, I was say, so ACE, going to mass every day, right? Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, ACE is like the Alliance for Catholic Education, okay. and you do a 
two year, um, you earn a two year master's in education while teaching. So they give you like intensive courses during two summers. Mm -hmm. um, and then during those school years, you also take courses. It's a little bit lighter, but you're also teaching full time. Oh, wow. um, so that summer we were spending like that first summer, we were like eight hours in class. We were both elementary. So we had like eight hours in class. We like shared meals together. We were going to daily mass and we were, you know, doing homework and then like, you know, sleep and then repeat the same thing the next day. <laughs> so we really started like sharing life together really early on in mm -hmm. that community with other like minded um, people, which I think is a beautiful thing about ACE is that you are really like it's just a lot of like minded people. Everyone's passionate about education or like um, building the church through kids first. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a neat community. Um, mm -hmm. And you guys get formed, not just taught education. You kind For of formed sure. in Christian discipleship at the same time. To your, this kind of the sharing of life you're talking about right here. Yeah. So the mm. the ACE um, has three like pillars: um, teaching, community, and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Right. I think they really. Um, I mean, yes, they form teachers. Like it's great, but I really think a lot of it is community and spirituality. Um, they, and spirituality in community, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, you live in community and you are, um, like, encouraged to pray together and share meals together. Like, mm -hmm. when we were – I don't know how it is now. I'm sure some of the things have changed. But when we were in ACE, um, we, were, we were encouraged to share at least two meals together each week. And, like, we – in my house, we rotated who cooked the meals. Mm -hmm. um, so you'd have, like, dinner duty and, like – I know it was really it was really neat. And then, like, one person each week would also come up with a, a community prayer a different night. Be like, hey, we're going to have a community prayer, and they would lead it. Um, it could be a, in a variety of – lots of different ways to pray. Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of encouraged us to do that. And we had, like, pastoral members of ACE who would visit us and, like, help – do you remember, like, right. So, yeah, not really not guide. only the academic faculty who come and do yes. the teaching supervision mm -hmm. and, and there's a like a check in and rubric and all that stuff for assessing how well you're doing as a teacher. Sure. But then they have a different person from Notre Dame come and do a pastoral supervision mm -hmm. and they make sure that you're working well with your community and you're praying mm -hmm. well and, mm -hmm. and really focusing on maybe even the more important goals like and building, relationships. Yeah, yeah, building relationships. Mm -hmm. Good. But I really think that's important in a cl in a classroom. Like mm -hmm. in like like in Catholic education we're forming whole people. It's like yes, I want you to grow in your mind and I'm going to help you do that, but I really want you to grow in virtue and in your in your spirit. Like that's that's why you're at Catholic school. <laughs> like yeah. like we can help you with the mind stuff. Yes, but I want you to be a good person and I want you to like like learn how to be in this community of students that you've been placed in and in this like it's like your school is a family it's like a second family mm -hmm. um, now how did the placement work how did um, transitioning from ace to Pensacola mm -hmm. happen for the two of you gotcha yeah so to That's clarify uh, oh, yeah. we were not placed in the same household we, no. we were not placed yeah. in the same community <laughs> no. uh, Aaron was in San Antonio, Texas, okay. at St. John Birchman School. Yes, right? and I was actually placed here in Pensacola, as uh, at St. John the Evangelist in Warrington. So, okay. mm -hmm. um, it, ACE has about ninety placements uh, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, typically, s schools, Catholic schools that are uh, across the southern United States, from California all the way to Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Typically, schools that that have maybe could be classified as under resourced, mm -hmm. um, but that varies. That definition varies depending on where you're at. Pensacola mm -hmm. is fairly well resourced. For Our sure. Catholic schools are very well resourced by comparison to maybe some of the other communities around the country, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe that was a stark difference between even my experience in Pensacola and, and Aaron's in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. That first year, like I I loved St. John Birchman's, but I was just like really thrown in there. Um, the class that I had had been two classes up until second grade. I taught second grade for ACE. And in second grade, they decided, oh, we're going to combine these groups of kids. Oh, and you have one class. And it was massive. It was just wow. this large, large number of really cute little seven-year-olds. I loved them so much. But I just felt really overwhelmed. And I didn't really feel like that much support from my school community. Mm -hmm. So like Dave and I would check in with each other at the end of the day. And he had a great first a year. Great school and, and great I would community. Like, <laughs> I would be like weeping on video chat because we did a lot of <laughs> gmail chat at that time and um 
and he'd be like encouraging me but also like telling me about how great his <laughs> his time was and so it was very different our first you know our first teaching years my second year was a lot better just because i had one year under my belt too you right know? I had, learn a lot. I had a small class of 15 right. high-achieving kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was cruising on cloud nine. Yeah. And, and funny enough, I still run into yeah. the students from that class mm-hmm. here in Pensacola. Most mm-hmm. of them are all college grads now. Some of them are starting families. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll see them at the at grocery store or golf course or church or wherever it mm-hmm. is. And, and um we just talk about how much fun that first year was. Well, and I, so I have great memories yeah. of it. But. Still good memories. Mine are a little different, though. Yeah. <laughs> and so you wrapped up in San Antonio and decided oh, yeah. so to what, cast your lot with this fellow. I know, yeah. <laughs> so we were engaged by the, like... October the beginning of, of the, the second, second year. year. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we were looking at, well, where do we go afterwards? We both wanted to stay in teaching. We mm-hmm. loved it. Both mm-hmm. of us were like, yeah, this is it. Um, and the nice thing about teaching is you can teach anywhere. Mm-hmm. Like there's schools. So we were looking at cities and I knew that I didn't want to stay in San Antonio. It just, I wasn't close to any family. It was, I felt kind of landlocked. I grew up in central Florida, closer to water. So um, I had visited Pensacola enough times that I was like, wow, this is such a great community. And both of us just felt drawn like, hey, this is a great place to raise a family. Mm-hmm. Like we just felt it early, mm-hmm. early on that mm-hmm. these people are great. The city seems like it's it was it was actually just at the beginning, I guess, of kind of growing a lot. Um, right. Right. 2009, kind of, 2010, 2011. Mm-hmm. Pensacola mm-hmm. was getting its footing. Mm-hmm. Right. It was so, it was starting yeah. to really transform downtown. They were building the baseball stadium. There mm-hmm. was just a lot of excitement and um yeah, we said let's. I mean, we can really start anywhere, mm-hmm. and, and let's let's do it here. And then a year later, his parents came down. My mom moved here. Well, my aunt moved here a couple of years ago. His sister moved here. So like, right. we've brought everybody here, and I think everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, I first met you both when you were teaching at St. John because yeah. we moved here in. 2015 and my son was in eighth grade Mm -hmm. in Dave's uh, Mm -hmm. class and um, my daughter was in fifth grade she didn't have Aaron but we met you through the church and through Mm -hmm. the school Mm -hmm. and uh, we started participating in the married couples uh, um, ministry together Mm -hmm. and stuff like that so I mean it was just it was heaven having both of you two there (laughs) but then Dave you decided "Mm, I think I need to move on somewhere else Oh, we also were gifted <laughs> with our, I think, our fourth child at that point. Yeah. And so okay. we were like, well, we need to see if God's opening some other doors financially for us, <laughs> right? Yes. And an opportunity at Sacred Heart yeah. Cathedral School opened Very up good. for yes. uh, the need for an assistant principal position. Mm-hmm. And um, talking with Mrs. Elizabeth Snow, the principal at the time, and Father James Valenzuela over at the cathedral. And, and that just, <clears throat> that became the next open door the next blessing um Mm -hmm. and and just gosh the rest is history right so uh, (laughs) moving over to sacred heart um stepping into an admin role and and kind of getting my hands involved in every aspect of school and parish life and then eventually moving across the street to the parish as the parish manager um in 2019 Mm -hmm. february of 2019 Mm -hmm. um Moving in right, right into a capital campaign and building project, and then shortly thereafter, uh, the the pandemic and Hurricane Sally, and, and really getting to see the entire uh, breadth and depth of what is involved in running a parish. And I still was at that time the director of development for the school too. So, um, just love Catholic education and love. The Catholic Church and love building up parishes and and uh, it's just been a, a wild ride, yeah. exciting. Wow. And Suzanne, to first yes. of all, I want to congratulate the Holy Spirit for leading the Sacred Heart. Well, I got to meet <laughs> okay. David Aaron. And just in case everyone's thinking that Dave moved into the penthouse suite or something like that, I met Dave first. Uh, my wife Kelly and I and our children moved to Pensacola in 2016, and we were touring schools. And Sacred Heart was there. And of course, we meet Mrs. Snell. And Snow brings us back into her office. And it's, oh, she shares an office with Dave Kimball. The, pr- the principal and the vice principal are in this, like, I don't know, it was like maybe 12 by 10 or something like that with two, <laughs> two, two chairs and two computers. And I was like, 
dang, y'all are uh, y'all are committed to this mission. Crowd, <laughs> I've never yeah. at the school that I taught in. I've never been to a school where the principal shared an office with the vice principal, and we immediately got the vibe. It was like, oh, this is like it, the, the 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 sense of Catholic identity, the sense of attentiveness to every single student and stuff like that it was a shared mission between you and and Mrs. Snell. And then we were also like, oh, Dave, you're married. You have children. We might be friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So we're yeah. we're happy to pick up. Very uh, good. Uh, well, I'm job. very happy for them too because obviously we're s- still close and uh, see yes. each other often. Right. And mm-hmm. I think that's a great thing. And and you're right. That's the thing about the Pensacola community is that mm-hmm. we're a small small large city. You know. Yes. And, I mean, yes. as as Aaron and I were talking about where we wanted to live, it was mm-hmm. the St. John's families and the St. John's community, both school and parish, that mm-hmm. made us stay in Pensacola. Yeah. So yeah. that that's yeah. really like we 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 loved our time at St. John's yeah. and, and credit them with being here today. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, Aaron. I remember. Um, you know, I think it was when you were maybe they're pregnant with your fourth or something. You made the tough decision to um, to stop your teaching career at that point I did. and become a stay at home mom. And mm-hmm. I know that, you know, there was a it's a big decision. And, and you know, you went through a mm-hmm. series of, you know, um, thoughts, emotions, the whole gamut. I so did. I remember talking yes. to you about it because I was like, this is it was really hard. Mm-hmm. I was um, I was a, I was used to the crazy routine of like teaching full time and having our little kids like we had um we had really great child care for them really, which really made it a huge blessing that I was working and I didn't have to worry about them but um and then I, I guess by the time two of them were already at St. John's right when I mm-hmm. was still teaching so yeah, when Dave when we got pregnant with our fourth child our sweet first daughter <laughs> um that's when God opened that door mm-hmm. for Dave to kind of transition to the parish side more, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And um, and we were looking at numbers in our budget, and it was like, Ugh, does it really make sense to, like, for me, like my whole paycheck would go to child care mm-hmm. at that point just because of numbers. <laughs> and um, and we were like, hey, this is an opportunity. Or I think you were like, mm-hmm. hey, you have an opportunity right now, like, Yes, you could keep working, but you could also stay home and see what that's like, you know, like being Mm -hmm. full time at home. And it was a really hard adjustment, but it was beautiful. And I am so grateful that I have that opportunity. I still have that opportunity to be at home and to be available. And and it is really hard to work full time and have kids, Um, especially, I think, being a teacher. I I have to give props to all the teachers out there because you're you. Yes, we all love kids. We're in education, but it's so it's draining. It's very exhausting, like with that many people that you're trying to form during the day and then you go home and you're like oh I have my own people to form you know and, and to help them grow in virtue and I'm feel zapped of virtue right now you know like so that was really nice to be able to focus solely on my own little people that we are trying to you know raise and um and become saints that's the goal right so it was a great, a great challenge, but it was definitely, I really floundered that first probably six months. Mm-hmm. I just was kind of like, I don't, I don't know. And then it hit, no, the next year was COVID, right? Mm-hmm. And then we were like, whoa, what a gift that I am home right now, or I would be teaching virtually and have all these kids at home. Well, and I know I some people did that. I know a lot of people did. Mm-hmm. And so mm. anyways. <laughs> Dave, along the way, you, in the midst of raising children, been a husband. You picked up a master's in business, business administration <laughs> right. yeah, from Franciscan University, which sort of set you up for this 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 parish role. And then, mm-hmm. like you said, you start. You know, our cathedrals were were blessed by by the Lord in this diocese. Both of our cathedrals have on, uh, undergone extensive renovations mm-hmm. and refurbishments, and you found yourself helping Father James along that process and uh, doing all the. Can you tell us about that? The experience of transitioning into the parish from education and sure, you know, sure. So. At the time we were discerning maybe my my next steps, I was thinking, well, you know, am I am I called to continue in Catholic education? Am I called to pivot? Am I? Uh, I didn't know exactly necessarily what my next steps would hold, um, but for whatever reason, I felt drawn to doing a master's of business administration. Um, 
I, I knew I needed to acquire maybe a little bit more diverse and practical skill set than uh, a philosophy degree and, and uh, education, though very practical, was, uh, was very um, defined and, and narrow. Um, and I, I said, well, I, I think this is where I'm supposed to be supposed to be going next and so Mm -hmm. discerned a few different programs and and ended up choosing franciscan university and uh absolutely loved my mba i was so jazzed at the end Mm -hmm. of it i I remember saying to aaron and anybody who would listen i was like everybody should get an mba (laughs) it was so (laughs) awesome like just the the practical business skills Mm -hmm. the accounting and finance and marketing and communication skills all of it i just felt like really Mm -hmm. set me up for whatever was next um very very valuable degree and I and I absolutely loved my Franciscan education mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the parish side uh, just getting able to being able to experience the relationship building aspects of fundraising mm-hmm. and running a capital campaign mm-hmm. and uh, there's a lot of storytelling that goes in, in that as well but also the number crunching and all of the bookkeeping mm-hmm. and all of the spreadsheets and the uh, answering the finance council's questions of can we afford this and how long is it going to take us to pay off this loan and so really diving in and learning through that process and mm-hmm. I'm grateful for all of the people that I was able to bounce ideas around with and learn from mm-hmm. um, we just had a, a great team at the cathedral of CPAs and lawyers and uh, people who were willing to sit down with me and answer any question that I had and, and grow and learn and pick in the brains of the people who had done it before. Um, and that's, that's really like what I ended up loving was just seeing how if we're truly going to be an evangelical church and be authentic and build and grow – Every aspect of our mission has to be authentic, including our finances. And we need to direct our finances toward our priorities and be transparent and collaborative and communicative about all of these aspects of the church. Um, And really, if we are, if we're living out our uh, even the financial aspects of our mission and ministry with authenticity and mission focused Mm -hmm. and um and we're transparent and invite people into that process to share in it with us. Um, well, it's really amazing to see how much a parish can grow <laughs> in all aspects of its right. mission if mm-hmm. it's aligned. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we don't, you know, I think sometimes people can get a little squeamish about talking about money or talking about fundraising. Um, mm-hmm. And for me, it was really like, these are all necessary things. These are all aspects of the way in which our church will grow and needs to grow and can grow. And really, we don't need to be anxious or squeamish about talking about money and and, and those aspects of the church. So um, I began to kind of find my niche in those discussions and in mm-hmm. those areas um, and ended up being asked to start Morningstar High School, uh, being asked uh, to serve on various committees over the years at a lot of our schools and other parishes and, and people calling me and asking me for advice and, uh, and how to you know, do pro formas and spreadsheets and projections and, and structure budgets and, and things like that. So, um, and he loves that and stuff. And I absolutely love it. So I, I guess I'm just a huge nerd, right? But, um, but uh, It's really my, my parents and I, we came down to Florida in 1996 from up north. Up north, a lot of the buildings are already built. You know, um, Florida is a building, you know, generally you'll find like there's there's growth and people need a new building and stuff. So their their experience is like, oh, my gosh, I moved to Florida. And then our entire Catholic life was just one capital campaign after another. It was just wow. one more one more building. And then the hurricane hit 2004. We needed another capital campaign. And a lot of times it can be exhausting for parishioners when it's not communicated well. They're just like, oh, my gosh, we've been doing this for years. And we're not really told exactly why or what's the point of the whole thing. Whereas the, ex- the experience for me and I think everybody else, the cathedral was, first of all, it was like, that was quick. Um, it was like, it started and then it was, it was complete, but then it was just, it was a joyful moment. It was in a moment where we're all called to participate and uh, offer um, our Thanksgiving through our, or through our treasure in a sense. And mm-hmm. there's going to be somebody walking you along the way. Um, and, uh, and then we got this amazing new cathedral that everybody, everybody, the first yes. time they walked in. <laughs> It was just like, whoa. I mean, I, there was just a general kind of sense of like, mm-hmm. this was this was worth it. And it's just provided a, a sense in which it's a welcoming, beautiful, light-infused um, 
not that the old cathedral was, you know, the dungeon or anything, but <laughs> it had some light issues, I think, in many respects. So anyhow, it was just, it was, it was a beautiful sense. If you can galvanize people and see that this is part of the mission, people respond and they love it and uh, are grateful. So Yeah, very true. Well, Erin, you've continued on in sort of the education <laughs> side, being a catechist there mm-hmm. at the cathedral. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, in doing that role and, um, you know, kind of... Um, running your home with your beautiful six children Mm -hmm. now how do you balance it all um day in and day out (laughs) i mean and you're smiling constantly i never see you down i never see you upset i think you've just got this spirit about you that's just amazing and so what is the secret to your success (laughs) secret um i have really gotten into a very um dedicated prayer routine in the morning Mm -hmm. i think that that really helps a cup of coffee with it (laughs) always coffee with my prayer book and i'm pretty much i don't deviate from that most days and i really feel like even if i'm really groggy and like this is really hard um i think it helps get me on the right foot for the day so I will say I think that helps. But, um, yeah, we have, we have our routines. It is like blessed chaos at our house, though. Um, I have to laugh, right? We have to giggle. But um, it is uh, – I think maybe people think it's like very, I don't know, calm and like procedural. There We do have some good procedures in place. My kids probably would tell you that. But it is also chaotic. It is yeah. it is fun. It is mm-hmm. loud, um, you know, joyful noise, I guess. But um, – it helps a lot that I have a teaching background <laughs> because I will say um, I I think one of my strong points was classroom management, which mm-hmm. is like when you have all the routines in place for your students to to do well in class. You can't just run willy nilly. Right. Um, so having that background helps a lot because we have a large family. And so if something's not working, I'm like, you know what? We need to change this routine because mm-hmm. it's not working. And we have a discussion about what, what kind of changes can we make to streamline our lunch making process or whatever the, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is. Um, but it also helps. So we have older kids now who mm-hmm. are extremely helpful. And that kind of evens out the workload a little bit more, too. Yeah. So. Just the age of your kids, by definition, should fight all the time. They should have <laughs> extreme rivalries because the three oldest boys are yes. how, how, how far so, apart? So, um, we have everyone's just about two years, except okay. for the last two are more like 18 months yeah. apart. But, um, <laughs> the boys actually they did go through a period, I think they're too older, where they really. They are highly competitive. They are, I, I think, I don't know, maybe it's just boys. or They, they get do not it from get us. it from either I of don't us. Know, right? We're not at <laughs> all competitive. Um, but they did go through a period where it was a lot of fighting, and we were constantly trying to, like, you know, okay, break it up, stop, you know, like it's just a game. Um, I think they've gotten really good at this point. They're, they are almost 10 and almost 12, mm-hmm. and I think they've kind of learned when they do need to quit. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, like I don't like how you're playing or whatever. They probably don't use those words, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, like, there's a, like, I think it's an age thing, developmental. So, like, the the middle child right now really does not lose well still. Yeah. We're working on it. But that would be the and one. Joe. Who, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Joe. Yes. Um, the whole family works on it, right? We know <laughs> when to quit because we're like, all right. Um, but they do, they do fight some. But I actually would say our kids actually get along really well. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. that they just... And I don't know if they don't, I can separate them or whatever. Again, classroom management. Yeah. Like I'm all about like, okay, well, you need some time by yourself in your room. You know, <laughs> <laughs> our oldest is 11, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then we're in the odd number years right oh, now. Yeah. So okay. 11, 9, 7, 5, 3, 1. Charlie just turned two. <laughs> oh, that's right. Charlie just turned two. So he's going to begin now. Within the next few months, all of our children will be in the even years. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. yeah. So. They all turn. That's true. Wow. Very helpful. Mm-hmm. It, is. it looks for, it is. from outside observers like. My gosh, that's like the most condensed kind of grouping, but they they do seem to like each other, and or at least let bygones be bygones. They do. I think they and, really do. Yeah, yeah. Which is we've tried to we've tried to like really foster a, a sense of family and togetherness, and like we like, and I've told them from the beginning that like you are each other's best friends. And in the beginning, mm-hmm. like, yes. they just listen. You know, now mm-hmm. they might roll their eyes. The older ones roll their eyes at me. I'm like, no, but you guys have each other for life. This is – and so I think having that dialogue or that um, narrative in our house, like, we built that community. You mm-hmm. know, like, I, I want you to realize that your like, your sisters and your brothers are your greatest gifts. You have each other forever. And, like, 
you might have trouble getting along right now. That's okay. We, that happens. But you always have each other and we practice forgiveness and mercy and like tons of lessons going on all the time in our house. <laughs> lots of big feelings yeah. yesterday. Lots of, lots big, of feelings. big feelings. Yes. But we talked through them. We're okay today. <laughs> you know? wow. New mercies every morning, right? Beautiful. Um, well, Dave, you are the CFO for the diocese, <laughs> so that's quite what? a step from. <laughs> that's quite a step from you know looking over at Aaron at Notre Dame right. um, to uh, you know becoming a teacher and uh, mm-hmm. moving on to uh, Sacred Heart School in the cathedral and now here. So. You know, so the job advertisement came out, you know, did you immediately think this is for me? Um, How did that discernment happen and what brought you here to this job? I guess I'm I'm sort of shocked when I think back in hindsight as to how quickly it progressed Mm -hmm. for, for, for just an initial discussion with Aaron and with a couple of friends and, and, uh, but really my, my motivations early on were, um, I felt the person who is in the CFO role needs to have parish and school experience in our diocese. And that was like number one. And so initially I just reached out to the bishop and, and the hiring committee and I said, look, whether whether you, you want to give me an interview or not, mm-hmm. I have opinions. <laughs> and, and I want to express those opinions about what I think this role needs. And uh, you know what happens when you put yourself forward and you express your opinions? <laughs> Eventually, somebody's just going to say, "Okay, well now you do it." Um, and uh, moving into that, moving into that role and having a lot of those conversations over over a few months, really, um, I, I don't think that long term this was a position that I had on my radar. It wasn't necessarily something that I was aligning my decisions in life to strive for. It really was just in in that moment a, a strong urging of the Holy Spirit to reach out and to put myself forward as somebody who can help in this process and and maybe guide the conversation. Um, And then it was a growing recognition that, gosh, maybe the the Spirit is actually calling me to do this role. Um, And so lots of of conversations, lots of prayer, lots of... uh, Lots of I knew back right and away. Forth. Mm. Dave brought this to me, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Yes!" <laughs> like it was really quick. I'm wow. serious. I just felt like, "No, that makes perfect sense." Like you would do a fantastic job. Like you have lots of gifts and talent. I mean, I'm married to you, obviously. <laughs> you have so many gifts and talents that you've already shared with our like our cathedral community, and I just am excited to see what he can do with the greater like Pensacola Tallahassee community. And so it made perfect sense to me, um, and I was like, "Yes, I'm I'm all in." I didn't have any, I didn't have any hesitations. Um, and I think part of that is that we have been praying about like being open to God's will. Like that's been constant throughout our marriage. Like, let's let's see where the Spirit takes us. Type, which is scary, right? But you pray mm-hmm. if you pray about it enough. I think it makes sense when an opportunity comes. You're like, "Oh, okay, yeah." At least I felt that way. So, you know, as one here, I was like, yes, this, this makes sense. You should, you should see what happens if you put your, you know, put your name in there and actually. Yeah. You can't get around it. This is, this is a mentality that sometimes lacks in the church. So we have a lot of lay people work for the church, right? A lot of them, you know, kind of ministry or catechesis or something like that. And it seems to not often translate that mission openness to the spirit into some of the more classic administrative, you know, mm-hmm. the C-suite positions, that type of deal. Mm-hmm. The truth is the church has a long, 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 long history of needing spirit-infused, open to mission, open to God's will people at every at every single level. Um even the even the more spreadsheety um, cufflinks types uh, sometimes. So I just think it's a unique gift for our diocese to see that embodied and especially supported by this this vigorous family life and and this commitment to the church that's been so demonstrated beforehand. So thank you, Aaron. Thanks for <laughs> elbowing them and getting them uh, to think more 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 deeply about it. And mm-hmm. for sure, Aaron has been on board and just so supportive right from day one. And uh, as I grew into the understanding that this is where I'm supposed to be. I have been repeatedly, repeatedly validated by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Just Mm -hmm. that this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And I I feel confident moving forward that, yes, this is absolutely where where I'm supposed to be serving the church. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Well, 
And by the way, just to let everybody know, Bishop Bill is a Notre Dame grad, and you guys are going to get, but that, that's just a happy <laughs> circumstance. Did you did you meet Bishop at Notre Dame, by the way, or anything? I did not, no. no. Okay. I was there, yeah, Dave and I met in the grad school program, so I was there for the four years um, before that, too. But no, I never, I never, well, I think at that point, though, he would would have been in Texas. Yeah, maybe or, or Arizona or, or something yeah. like that. Oh, the yeah, legend yeah, yeah. of Father Bill Walk was, was present, though. Yeah. From what I've heard, from what I've heard about things. We don't have to go into it. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Fun. Well, I just want to say that you two are incredibly inspiring. Um, to me, to so many others, I mean, I think you just really can balance everything. Um, the spiritual side, the family side, the professional side, and Thank everything. You. Um, you know, my daughter is considering the ACE program in right. a lot That's of ways right. because of you two. Oh, wow. So, you know, so your legacy does, you know, kind of lead on. And I just want to say thank you for being pillars in our community and mm-hmm. for just being two incredible people. So thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. Here, here. That's humbling. Yes, it is. The ACE program, guys, I mean, we always kind of pitch, go to the website or something like that. It is, if you have people in your life you know are committed to Catholic mm-hmm. education, it's a totally unique program. It's it not is. your average master's in education. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will get, the cool thing is like you guys were sent. It wasn't like, okay, go apply for jobs. Right, you got sent, sent mm-hmm. to a place. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a beautiful vocational store there. Mm-hmm. Also, Miss mm-hmm. Baracco, our mm-hmm. yeah. the Sacred Heart Prince, another ACE she did too. Um, yeah. uh, program who just decided to stay mm-hmm. because she fell in love yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> down here. Um, and uh, Father Jeffrey Mooney is now a priest uh, okay. in the Congregation yes, of the Holy Cross. He, he did ACE with me in Pensacola and stayed at Catholic High for a number of oh, years afterwards. I think right. maybe five years wow. after and, okay. um, and is now... Uh, a priest at Notre Dame. Wow. wow. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, guys, here, here. Everything that Suzanne said, agreed. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> well, guys, it was a lovely story to tell, and we'll have more lovely stories to tell from Bishop Bill as he continues the second part of his teaching series on the Apostles. So we'll see you back here in two weeks' time. Thank you for tuning in today to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. If you would like to know more about our podcast, please visit our website, gaudiumetspes.net, or go to ptdiocese.org and click the button that says podcast. If you listen to the audio version from an app such as Apple Podcast, Spotify, or iHeartRadio, be sure to rate, review, and comment. If you watched us on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe or leave us a comment there as well. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>